What's good? Hey, welcome to First Baptist Church of Grace Summit. Good morning. morning. How y'all doing? Good. I want to give you a few announcements before we start, okay? We'll jump right in. Y'all with me? All right, you're good. Okay. If you look at your bulletin, hey, we print it because uh, you know how to read it, and so I'm not going to read it verbatim and insult your intelligence by doing that, but I'm going to share a couple of announcements with you. Today begins our Engage gathering. Somebody say Engage. Engage. Engage like, uh, you know, like that guy from Star Trek. You know what I'm saying? Engage. That's okay. I'm the only nerd in the building today. But uh, Engage gatherings begin today. We're going to have worship to, to, together, but we're going to have a special guest here. I'm going to introduce you here in a little bit. Tomorrow night, say tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Six o'clock, say six o'clock. Six o'clock. Engage gathering, say engage. engage. All right, that's where we're going to be. Tuesday, same deal, six o'clock, engage gatherings. Wednesday, Wednesday we usually have our prayer service, 6.30. Bump it to six, engage gatherings, okay? That's where we're going to be. It's going to be good. Every single night, I know that a lot of things are going on. A lot of people are watching online today. Uh, a lot of stuff going on. A quarantine here, a quarantine there. How many times have you heard that in the last forever? So... Uh, lots of stuff going on right now, but every single one of these that you can come will be worth you coming, will be a blessing. And so you come to those. Deacon's meeting is going to be Thursday. Uh, you'll see the men's breakfast that we usually have on Saturday morning. Uh, we may reschedule that. We, we don't have an answer for that yet, but we are not going to have men's breakfast that day because uh, Betty Rutherford's funeral is that morning at 1030. So we're just going to free up that morning so that we can be uh, with with the family there at 10:30, and we'll talk later about men's breakfast. Okay, so that's what we got to do to to do that. A couple other things that you can see on your bulletin there: uh, Operation Christmas Child. OCC is coming around the corner. There's a good paragraph there um, that gives you explanation of what we need to do there, stuff that we need to collect and get ready for, and all of that good stuff. Baby bottles. We collect baby bottles from Mother's Day to Father's Day for uh, a pregnancy care center there in Cuba, Missouri. We collected just shy of $1,000 for, um, for that pregnancy care center. To go, that's what it means to be pro-life, by the way, yes. That's what it means to be pro-life, is we come alongside those folks that are in pregnancy situations. We love them because we think life is precious. We believe life is precious because God says it's precious. So that's what we did. Praise God for that. Outside of that, if you're visiting with us today for the first time, we're so thankful for you. If you're here physically, uh, there is a little thing there in your front, a little, uh, little slip there for you to fill out to your level of comfortability. You can put that in the offering plate as it comes around later in the service. If you're watching online, which a lot of people this week told me, hey, pastor, I'm going to be watching online. That's great. Would you comment or like the live stream so that I know that you're here? Some, some folks watch on Facebook, some folks watch later on in the day on YouTube. Just comment and let me know that you're here. That makes me uh, feel better as kind of the shepherd of the church to know that you are watching and that you're engaging uh, even when you're quarantining and doing those things. So we appreciate you guys. Uh, love you all that are watching. If you're watching online, maybe for the first time, and you want to uh, sign our, fill out our visitor card, you can text 636-742-1011, text I. Uh, to 636-742-1011. We're going to spit you back a digital visitor card for you to fill out. So if you're watching for the first time, or maybe you've never done that, just send us, just text us that number. We'll send you back the digital visitor card, and uh, you can fill that out, and we can get back to you. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to answer any questions you have about the church. We'd love to do all of those things, okay? So uh, with all that said, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing to the Lord, okay? That's what we're going to do. Let's stand, and let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that you are God. And here today, that you are not far from our reach. If we seek after your face, you're not far from any one of us. So, Father, would you prepare our hearts right now in this place? Uh, would you still our hearts and remove all of these obstacles that have mounted that the enemy would love for us to focus on today? Help us to focus upon you alone. Uh, Lord, let us engage in your mission. Let us engage in your plan for us. Uh, let us hone in and fix our eyes upon Jesus, the, the founder, the finisher of our faith, Lord, the one who runs before us and has won the victory before us. Oh, Father, in all these things, we pray that we might glorify you and lift high the name of Jesus, for it's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. 
Give me a second. Let's sing to the Lord here. All right, let's sing together. The song's called Mighty Warrior.
above every other name. He's the only name under heaven by which men can be saved. We praise that name together. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness drives.
is good. And let's turn to our tithes and offerings. If you're visiting with us, don't feel like you're any, under any compulsion today. If you're watching for the first time, don't feel like you're under any compulsion today. But we believe that God loves a cheerful giver and one who gives without compulsion but out of the overflow of their worship. This is part of our worship service. That's why we do this together. And so uh, Mike is going to come and he's going to pray uh, over our offering today as our ushers come and, and collect that offering. If you give online, we do that through Tithely, and uh, that can be a great resource for you. That's how Sarah and I give. And so um, we're, we're millennials. We don't even know. We don't even have a checkbook. Okay, so uh, that's how we do it. And so <laughs> we, I don't even know if I would know how to write a check. I'm sorry. Um, that's how I do it. So I just do it online. Maybe that's YouTube. And so that's how we're doing that today. So, uh, and, and, of course, um, in the offering plate as well. So, Mike, would you come and pray? Children, you're dismissed to Children's Church, okay? Your Children's Church leader there. I want to introduce our speaker, and I think I will do this every night, but I want to introduce our speaker, um, Brother Bob Caldwell, is one of the pastors over at the Ridge Church, our sister church uh, in Villa Ridge. And Brother Bob and I have served, and Sarah has, as well, served in different capacities and uh, for many years now and got to know him and uh, just love this brother and so uh, excited for what he's going to share for you today and tomorrow kind of a two-parter okay so you 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 have not heard the whole thing as I understand it until you've come tomorrow okay so be there be square okay so uh, I'm going to invite Bob to come up I'm just going to pray for him and he's going to share the message with y'all okay father I just want to pray for my brother Bob we love him, and we love his family and uh, his sweet children. I just want to pray your spirit upon him as he shares your word, as he opens up the Bible and preaches. We pray, Lord, that your spirit might make it abundantly present that this is him, that this is you and not him. Uh, Father, that you would hide him uh, on the other side of your cross, Lord, that you would strengthen him by your grace. Father, that you would prepare hearts today that are listening online, uh, that are here in our midst. Uh, Father, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see, and, and Lord, you would empower us to live out what we're being challenged to do. Help us, Lord, to engage 
with you and not uh, phone in religion. Uh, help us not to have dead, dry faith, but a live faith, which is accompanied by works of love. Help us to do that, that you would be glorified above all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it is always good to be at First Baptist Church Grace Summit. Just, uh, I've grown to love this place, and I've had the opportunity to preach here a few times, and especially since uh, Tommy's been here, but once whenever Ron was here as well as your interim. And I, I want to tell you, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, I've been around just a little while, you can tell by my face, okay? Uh, but I can tell you, this is one of the greatest young pastor and wife teams that I have ever seen, let alone in the state of Missouri right now, that I've ever known. And amen. Yes, yeah, give the Lord a hand. Uh, and I know you all know how blessed you are. And I, I certainly don't say that to embarrass them. Uh, and I know their humility. They walk in and their children walk in. But man, I was just, again, blown away this morning. I taught Michaela not very long ago how to write a check. And we can meet afterwards if you want <laughs> and be able to do that. It's a smart generation. I know. We go, but it's a, an incredibly brilliant generation. And I love that about them. So. Did anybody not get one of these handouts? Okay, it's a handout. The heading is, who's it about? Anybody raise your hand real high? And we got a couple people here that'll, that'll hand you one really quick, okay? Anyone at all. Hope I didn't ruin the people's worship online because I realized about four songs in, if that phone's picking my voice up right behind it, they're in trouble, okay? okay. Beautiful, okay. That, that's, that's a positive thing, I'll tell you. Because uh, uh, God heard me sing and, and called me to preach. So, but anyhow... Uh, but I can tell you what we're going to do this morning is we're going to begin, as you can see on this sheet. I'm a guy that loves to hear the pages of God's Word being turned in the Bible or phones being turned on or whatever, right, to be able to get to it electronically. We had so many verses to cover today. I don't want to make you nervous with that. But so many verses, I wanted us to be able to hit these on this sheet of paper. You can take notes uh, on that sheet of paper as the Holy Spirit uh, would lead you as well and something that you can take home with you. But here's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to begin, as you can see, in the book of Revelation. And we're going to see this picture that God allows John to see. We know John is a human instrument that wrote the book of Revelation. God is the author, amen, because it's God's word. But he allows John to see this glimpse of heaven and what it's going to be like at worship time and who's going to be there. And then he doubles down on it in Revelation chapter 7. We're going to look at that here in a moment. And then we're going to back up to Genesis 1-1, and we're going to hit some very familiar places in the Old Testament this morning that talks about how God has always had this incredible, passionate plan and who he wants to use in this plan. We're talking about engage. And I tell you, the thing we're going to talk about this morning is how can you and I, and you pray for me, because the easiest thing I do is get up and say this stuff. You pray I live it, okay? Because I don't always live it. Sometimes I just get up and flap my gums. And you pray that I'll live this as well. But that you and I would engage with his mission. That we would engage with his plan and understand fully well who, who it's all about, okay? Who our life really is about. So if we do not embrace this message today, if you're here and you are a follower of Jesus Christ and uh, you know that you've surrendered to him and you do not engage this message today, guess what? You go to heaven because this thing called grace. Amen. You surrender to Jesus. Your sins are forgiven. It's the only reason why and you're still going to heaven. But when you draw your last breath, you might think back on your life and use words like apathetic or average. ho hum. Okay. If we do embrace this message, though, today, if we'll embrace it, then when we look back on life, we use words like radical and passionate. It made a difference. It was worth living. And God's inviting us to join him on this journey that is second to none. So we're going to look at this first sheet. We're going to begin at the end of the, of the Bible. We're going to back up to the very beginning of the Bible. So here we go. Revelation 5, 9. Here's the picture that God allows John to see about heaven, and this is what it says. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and were redeemed to, to us by God, by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. I'm going to say it again. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals and you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. Say every tribe, every tribe. and tongue um. and people. And nation. Let's do that again. Every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Here's what God is saying through John. He's saying, listen, whenever worship time happens in heaven, when it's all said and done, at least one person from every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation will have not only heard the gospel, but responded to it positively. 
I mean, not everybody has been reached yet. Some say there's about 11,250 people groups worldwide. That's heart languages. By the way, the word nations there, as we read it, we think of geographical boundaries. That's not what it was talking about in the original language. It's talking about heart languages, ethnic groups. So there are about 11,250. I mean, different organizations say different amounts. They, they use different metrics. But uh, people groups, heart languages, alive and well on planet Earth today, about 7,080 of those people groups are considered unreached. That means less than 2% have come to Christ. And about 3,150 of those are unengaged and unreached. That means, as far as we know, not only are they unreached, but we don't, know, we don't know of any church, any Christian organization, no one has yet taken the gospel to them. But the gap is closing rapidly. And Jesus says in Matthew 24, uh, and when this gospel is preached to all nations, then the end will come. So we know he's going to return. None of us know when. He doesn't even know when. But I'll tell you, according to Scripture, it's when that last ethnic group has been presented with the gospel and at least one has responded because God says to John tell everybody here's my word worship time in heaven at least one person from every tribe every tongue every people every nation will be present at worship time first Baptist grace I'm going to think about this for a second of those 3,150 really heart languages that might not yet be heard in heaven not yet they will be because it's in the Bible wouldn't it be incredible to play a, a part some part and you already do by giving of seeing some of those added during worship time because God is willing. So listen, every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation, say every tribe, every tribe. and tongue, and, tongue. And, people. and people, and nation, at least one person. I'm not saying everybody's going to heaven. The Bible would even say broad is the gate that leads to destruction, narrow the gate that leads to heaven. The majority will not embrace the gospel, but at least one person from every heart language will be present when it's all said and done, okay? God mentions it again through John and Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Listen to this, the next verse on your list. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, from all nations, say all nations, all nations. Tribes, tribes, peoples, peoples and, tongues, and tongues, were standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. Every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation will be there. Now, here's the deal. I'm one of those guys that believe that Jesus died that none should perish. But I'm going to tell you, this right here is going to happen with me or without me. This is going to happen with you or without you. And here's the reason why we know that. Because it's in the Bible. God said at least one person from every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation is going to be there. So here's the deal. I can hit snooze in my Christian life, take grace for granted, still die and go to hell, or go, go to heaven. Sorry, hear that again. Everybody say heaven. Okay, only because of the grace of God. I want to repeat that too. We can still go to heaven. But some of us in this room, like me, are just old enough to know how quickly a decade flies by. Or we can be a part of what God is going to accomplish with or without us. With you, without you, with me, without me. It's going to happen. But he's inviting us. He's saying, will you be a part of this mission? And what he wants to do is give you the greatest rush of your life. The most passionate radical. So jump on a plane in 2022 and go to an unreached. No. There are people all around us right here in Franklin County, in Jefferson County, in St. Louis County. All over the place right here. And there's no varsity team. There's no junior varsity team. We're all missionaries. Next door neighbor sometimes harder than me for me than Senegal, West Africa. And so we're all missionaries, all equally important, but God is saying, I want you to join me. So we're going to back up to the beginning of the Old Testament, and we're going to look at some familiar places this morning, and I'm going to be able to go through them quickly because you know these stories. But I, in each one of these stories, there's this pinnacle verse that tells us why God really did what he did. There's a lot of other truths and principles in every one of those stories we need to continue to learn, continue to teach, continue to preach, hopefully continue to live. But there's always this one verse that stands out that says, but here's the big ticket reason. So let's begin at the beginning. John, or Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We know that, right? Uh, by six verses, or six chapters and six verses later, God regretted it. Now that was a long, quite, a, quite a span of time. But listen to what it says in Genesis 6.6. 6. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, 
and he was grieved in his heart. So what happened? We know Adam and Eve chose to disobey God. They sinned. It broke that perfect, perfect, perfect relationship they had with God. They were kicked out of the garden. Uh, they had children. Their children had children. Their children had children. Their children had children. Their world began to populate, and sin ran rampant. And God, by Genesis 6, 6, said, I'm grieved. I'm sorry I even created man. So what did he do? He hit the refresh button, didn't he? In Genesis 6, 8, here's what happens. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We know that Noah comes into the scene. Everybody say grace. grace. Say grace. grace. Here's why I want that to stand out. Noah was a good man. The Bible even says Noah was a good man. He had some hiccups later on in his life, without a doubt. But he was a good man, the Bible says. But the only reason why God used Noah wasn't because we could put Noah on a pedestal and say, wow. It's because Noah found grace. The same grace you and I found. Amen? Yes. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, I'm not taking anything away from maybe what was one of the greatest acts of faith that I've ever read about. And that's I guess, in my mind as I picture Noah taking the first swing at the root of a gopher tree for a 200-year project because rain was going to fall nobody had ever seen before. You want to talk about faith. He was a good man. But none of it would have happened without the grace on him of God. And it's the same grace we have today. So we know that eight people get in that boat, right? And we know who it is. It's known as wife. It's uh, Noah's three sons and his daughters in laws right? So eight people get off the boat, and they're on it about 150 days, 40 days and 40 nights it rains, but about 150 days before uh, they were actually able to, to get off of that ark. And what happens in Genesis 9-1? The first commandment in the Bible appears right here in Genesis 9-1. And it says, so God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. First commandment, be fruitful and multiply. You know, it's the only commandment we stuck to. All the rest of them, not so much, okay? Be holy, follow God, love God, no. Be fruitful and multiply. Done, right? Okay? Says the guy with five kids. So anyhow, we're all about being fruitful and multiplying, and that's what they did. And the earth began to fill again, and then here's where it kicks into a high gear for me. Genesis 12, 3. Everybody say Genesis. Genesis. Say Genesis. Genesis. I want you to say Abraham. Abraham. Say Abraham again. Abraham. It's important we remember his name, okay? Listen to what it says. God says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth. What's that sound like? Every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation, right? All the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God says to Abraham, basically he's saying, I'm going to give you a son. From that son, a great nation is going to be born. And from that nation, a Messiah is going to come. We know it's Israel. We know it's Jesus. He's saying, from you, all the families, say all the families, all the of the earth shall be blessed. Isn't that incredible? So then God takes off on this dead sprint using ordinary people. Sometimes we think they're extraordinary, but I'm telling you, they're the, they're the same as us. They had the same hang-ups. They had the same struggle with lust. They had the same struggle with all kinds of stuff. But God used them, but he used them for one main purpose. And so I want to begin to hit those familiar places. The first one is Moses. We love that story, right? I do. Man, the little basket, he's out there in the river. He's found. He's raised. Uh, all of a sudden, he becomes this great leader. And God says, you know, it's time to go and get out of, get out of Egypt and you know how God used him multiple, multiple times from the plagues to parting the Red Sea. I mean, again, it was God doing it, but Moses, there's all kinds of biblical principles, all kinds of truths, all kinds of things that we need to learn and hopefully live. But there's one big ticket item as to why God did the whole Moses thing. And I want you to know it was not about Moses. A lot of times I think, man, what a great man of God. And as the old saying goes, no such thing as a great man or a great woman of God. We are only men and women of a great God. Amen? It's always about God. And this comes out so strong here. Listen to what it says. In Exodus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, is kind of that pinnacle verse. Now the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine before him, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's sons the mighty things that I have done in Egypt and my signs, God says, <coughs> which I have done among them that you may know that I am the Lord. The reason why the whole Moses story happened, again, hear me, Sunday school teachers, leaders, keep teaching all those principles, keep preaching all those principles, 
Pray that I'll live those principles. Many, many principles, but the pinnacle is God said, I did it so people will know who I am, who God is. It was all about God. <clears throat> so I want to submit to you this morning, it wasn't about Moses, it was about God. Let's go to Joshua. We know that story well. 24 chapters of battles. Great, great, great book. Uh, I love from uh, Be Strong and Courageous, Do Not Be Afraid, Nor Dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go, Joshua 1 9. All the way to the end of the book, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord from a young man to an old man. And he continues to be faithful with God. Battle after battle after battle, incredible stories. But I want to tell you why God allowed the whole Joshua series to take place. I believe the big ticket item, even though there's a lot of great principles, and I'm not taking away from those, the big ticket item is in Joshua 4.24. Listen to what it says, that all the peoples of the earth may know. Say all the peoples. All the peoples. Say every tribe, every, tribe. every tongue, yeah. every people, every nation. So all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord and that it is mighty and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. It wasn't about Joshua. It was about the world knowing who our God is. So I want to submit to you it wasn't about Moses. It was about God. It wasn't about Joshua. It was about God. And I want to say it's not about you. And hear me. It's not about me. It's about God. Who does our life really belong to? Why are we here? The whole world is asking that. What's our purpose? You know how many people don't have a reason to get out of bed tomorrow? It's not just because they don't like Mondays. I'm, I'm, they're struggling. I meet people all the time that whenever they're in their teens, they say, it's, it's going to kick into my 20s. And I have understanding. I have purpose. I have meaning. And they blast through their 20s quicker than they thought. They're in their 30s. They're going, I'm still young. I've got time to figure this out. And about the time they hit their mid-40s, they're scared to death. That everything ahead of them is the same stuff that's in their rearview mirror. And they're beginning to ask, why am I even here? And I'm going to tell you, the only thing that makes sense is a God who created us for an incredible purpose to make him famous. So one day when we die because of his grace, we not only say, what a way to live. But we have this home in heaven. It's not about works. It's about grace. And I don't want anybody to get confused there. We don't go to heaven because we live this. We go to heaven because we surrender to Jesus. But that strength, whenever we surrender to Jesus, allows us to live this. Jesus is the only way to heaven. It's it, but I'm going to tell you, the only way, Jesus is also the only way to live the best life right here on earth. Heard John Marshall say that yesterday, and that really struck He said it better. But, man, it stood out to me. And so the big reason why God allowed the whole Joshua thing to take place, the main reason was that all the peoples of the earth would know. So let's go to the story of David. I love that story as well. I have five kids. We used to tell these stories multiple times at our family devotion before we went to bed. And, uh, and they would, I, we'd let them request stories. And I can't tell you how many times one of these would come up on the list. And so, uh, but anyhow, story of David. We know, little boy, shepherd, uh, his dad says, go out and take some uh, bread and some cheeses for the captains of your brother's army and three of his oldest brothers were in army against the Philistines and they were getting ready to fight Goliath and we know that story very well. All kinds of great principles in that story. All kinds of. One of my favorite moments is whenever Eliab, the oldest brother, says to David, David, why are you even here? You were just here to see the blood and guts of war. Well, who, who'd you even leave dad's sheep with? He's basically saying, listen, little brother, you little baby boy, you're here trying to act like some kind of big man. And David said back to his brother, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? And God plus none is a majority. And he allowed a little teenage boy to go down and do business, right? Because it was all about God. All kinds of principles in that. But listen to the pinnacle verse in 1 Samuel 17, 46. It says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. This is David speaking. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses... Of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. Why? That all the earth may know that there is a God of Israel. All the earth. It wasn't about David. It was about God. And I want to say it again. It wasn't about Moses. It was about God. It wasn't about Joshua. It was about God. It wasn't about David. It's not about you and me. Now, I'll say this today and tomorrow. You'll catch me living like it's all about me. 106 Heritage Hills Place has never been my home. Really, it's more the banks than it is mine anyhow. But anyhow, I'm, you, know, you know what I'm saying? 
I act like it's my home. We are not home yet. One day we will go home. It'll be the greatest moment of our life. Now, because we love children and grandchildren and all this stuff, and we can't get a full picture of heaven or we'd be useless here, we don't want to leave yet. I don't. And it's, it's grieving whenever we lose someone we love. But the Bible says, grieve it of earth and rejoice it of death. And one day we'll all be in glory together for all eternity. But we'll look back on it and I wonder if we'll think apathy, average, or if we'll think passionate and radical. Because here's the deal. God is inviting us. Can you imagine? He's inviting us to join him on something that's going to get done with or without us. Because it's in his word. But he's saying, I want to give you the greatest rush of your life. It's my mission. And it's always about making him famous. So every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation hear the gospel. Because at least one's going to respond. At least one of each one of those will be in heaven. But we move on. We get to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Man, I love that story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. My favorite part of the story, because we know what's going on. They build this image of this really conceited king named Nebuchadnezzar, a really wicked guy. And every time music plays, it's forehead to the dirt, right? Everybody's supposed to bow and worship the image of that king. And three guys are standing. I think they, they stood out, right? Without a doubt. So they're drugged before the king. <coughs> they're kind of given another opportunity, but I'll never forget what they say. My favorite part. Our God is able to deliver us. But even if he chooses not to. We're not going to bow. They didn't have any idea what was going to happen whenever they went into that fiery furnace. But to those guys, they were going to stand regardless. That's kind of life, isn't it? We don't know how it's going to come out on the other end. I'm going to talk about that a little bit tomorrow night. But I want to tell you, these guys still were willing to stand. Crank up the furnace seven times hotter. The men that threw them in, those soldiers even died from the heat whenever they opened the door and it splashed out on them. Those three men were thrown down and roped. And the next morning, we know Nebuchadnezzar comes to the door, and he looks at him, and there's not just three in there, but a fourth that looked like the Son of God, right? Ropes were off. Hair hadn't even been singed. Didn't even smell like smoke. Amazing story. But why did all of that happen? I could probably, you could probably list 15 great principles in the next 15 minutes that could be taught and keep doing that. But here's the big ticket. It's found in Daniel 4, 1 and 2. Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all people, say all peoples, say nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. You did great. Listen to what he says. Peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the most high God has worked in me. Now he's still taking credit. This guy, man, I'm telling you. But here's the deal. And I'm not saying Nebuchadnezzar had some kind of, man, suddenly he believed God and, and had any kind of relationship. As a matter of fact, I've got it marked here. Uh, just the verses prior to that, Daniel 4, verses 1 and 2, are the closing verses in Daniel chapter 3, uh, verse 29. And uh, I think it's verse 29 and, well, 30, something like that. Here's what it says. Therefore, I make a decree. This is Nebuchadnezzar. Right before he says, peace be to you. Therefore, I make a decree. That any people, nations, or language that speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses shall be made into an ash heap. I don't think he was exactly somebody following God. Never heard of evangelism strategy like that, okay? So this guy was still just as wicked. But even God uses the mouth of a wicked king because of what he really intended to get done through Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego for this guy to say to all peoples, all nations and all languages that dwell in all the earth, you better check out the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why did God do the whole Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego story? The big reason why was to make him famous, to make God famous. Then we go to Daniel. Daniel the lion's den. I'm telling you, another great story. We don't need to unpack it because we know it. But I'll never forget some of my favorite parts of that story. Guys that are jealous of Daniel and King Darius actually like Daniel. And these guys tricked him. 
Some of the king's men tricked him and said, why don't you make a decree that says anybody that seeks any wisdom other than from you will be thrown into the lion's den. And they fed into the man's ego and every man's got an ego. And so King Darius said, I think that's a good idea. And he signs a decree. Well, those men knew all along that Daniel was going to keep praying, seeking God. So they come before King Darius and say, guess what? Daniel, he's uh, seeking somebody else's wisdom. Darius did not want to throw him in, but knew that he was the one that signed the decree. Threw him into the lion's den. Didn't even, King Darius didn't sleep. Next morning, he comes to the mouth of the lion's den, and he says, Daniel, did your God deliver you? I think that's so intriguing, so telling. Daniel says, King Darius, may you live forever. I'm here. And you know how the story ends. The three guys that tricked the king, thrown in the lion's den, suddenly they had a healthy appetite, right? But here is the big reason why. With all the great principles we can teach out of that, and keep doing it, here's the great reason why, the biggest reason why. Daniel 6, verses 25 and 26. Then Darius wrote to all people, say all peoples, all peoples. say nations, nations. and languages, that dwell in all the earth. Here it comes. Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel. No, nobody can make somebody else tremble in fear. We know that. This is the lost guy's way of saying, pay attention to this guy's God. He's the real one. So I want to say to you this morning and say to me this morning, you got to hear me. Easy to say this stuff. Different to live it. You pray and you ask me from time to time, how's that working out for you? Do you understand why you're here? Because too many times I don't. But it wasn't about Moses. It was about God. It wasn't about Joshua. It was about God. It wasn't about David. It was about God. It wasn't about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It was about God. It wasn't about Daniel. It was about God. And it's not about you and me. I want to submit to you that our life is all about God. And every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation, at least one will person from that will be reached with the gospel. And he's saying to us, while there's a heart beating in our chest, while our lungs still have the ability to breathe, you've got this opportunity to join me on this race. That's what God's saying to join him on this rush that will cause us to say every day, that's my purpose. That's what it's all about. We close in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. This is after 400 years of silence between the Old and New Testament. Very intentional silence. Say Abraham. Amen. Remember Genesis 12.3? Okay. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. Through you, all the families will be blessed. Listen to what he says. After 400 years of silence, God speaks. And here's what it says. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, the son of who? Abraham. Promise kept. I'm telling you, God wants to use us in ways that we can't even imagine. And some he'll call to, to give. And some he'll call to go. Some he'll call to give and go. Some, all of us, he'll call to pray. But it's all equal. The most powerful thing that anyone can do is pray. I'm convinced of it. My family has been the benefactor of your church's prayer. I can't even tell you how many hundreds of times you all have prayed for our hand. The most powerful thing any of us can do is pray. And we can be at the very end of our life and still do the most powerful. We can be the smallest child that has comprehended the gospel and surrendered to Jesus and still be about the most powerful. Isn't that incredible how God does that? But some he'll call to go. And some he's equipped to give. And everybody is equal in this mission. But I wonder as we talk about engage. Here's the mission. I wonder if we'll make a fresh commitment today. Say, God, I'm in. You may say, well, what am I in for? I don't know. Uh, the thing is for us to say to him, God, I trust you enough. I, I really believe that you really are a God that loves me. And if I say I'm in regardless, you're not going to suddenly send me to some kind of place that I just absolutely hate or dread or, or send me to, to do something that 
I really believe that it'll be the passion of your life. But regardless, even not knowing of what it would be, because he won't dump the whole truckload on us at once. What does he have for you for the remainder of your years here on earth? I wonder if you'd make a fresh commitment today to say, I'm in, whatever that is. I'm going to ask Tommy and Sarah to come. We're going to have a song of invitation. Here's the invitation this morning. If you're here this morning and you already know that you're going to heaven when you die, not because you're so good, but because Jesus was so good for you about 2021 years ago, and you've surrendered to his free gift, and you know his blood is the only way to heaven, and you've surrendered that. He died. He rose again. You surrendered. I want to ask you to ask him this question. And God, give me, the, give me the strength to surrender to you all fresh and new. You might have just surrendered to him on your way here this morning. That's great. Will we surrender again? God, whatever it is, you give me the marching orders. And I'm in, regardless of what it is, while there's a heart still beating in my chest, I'm in. And then ask him this question. What do you want me to do about it right now? What he might want you to do is come to Tommy, someone else in the room, later on. Kind of say, hey, hold me accountable to this. He might want you just to pray right there in a pew where you'll be standing or sitting. He may want you to come forward to an old-fashioned altar and pray. I'm not here to manipulate anything, and you do only as the Holy Spirit leads you. But I think there's something special about old-fashioned altars. When God calls, you maybe need to come to an altar and just pray fresh and new. But I never want to take for granted that every person in the room, especially the crowd this size, would say, I'm 100% sure that if I died tonight, I'd go to heaven. Maybe there are some people here that would say, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven when I die. You can know, and you can know before, before you leave this place. And God will meet you at the point of your need. And he is head over heels in love with you. Bob, you don't know what I've done. You're right, you don't. I don't know. And you don't know what I've done. But I can tell you, I've done stuff in my life that should have stained me for good. And at 24 years old, he saved me. And I'm still wicked. I still struggle. But And I know I'm to take every thought into captivity. And I know he gives us a way of escape every time we're tempted. But some days, I just choose not to take it. And I choose to sin. The, man of, the heart of man is wicked. And there's no sin too big for God to forgive. And today you can walk out of here with no shame. You can walk out of here with peace. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you're here saying, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven when I die, I'm going to ask you to do something. They'll take some guts. You can meet me right here in the front and just come to me. I'll turn this mic off and just say, I don't know. I don't know. And although you're saying you don't know you're going to heaven, let me share with you from God's word in just a few minutes how you can know or, uh, or even ask you're watching online, you might, you know, that card that whenever you text hi in it, that uh, the word hi that Tommy mentioned to you earlier, you know, they'll send you that card. Put something there. Call the church. Whatever you do, this is too important and life's too short to know. But right now, let's all stand to our feet. Believer, you know Jesus. Is God calling you an old-fashioned altar? Can you do business where you are? Will you say yes to whatever it is? And if you need to come and say, I don't know, I'll be right there.
Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for Bob. And Lord, even as we walk through the scripture together on Sunday morning, how refreshing it is to just see this panoramic view, your view, because your gospel is a story. It's your story of your glory. And Father, we, we're just thankful that we get to be a part of it. And Lord, you have a call upon our lives as your sons and daughters. And Father, help us to engage, not hit the snooze button, but the Lord, just a ride in grace that grace may abound. But Lord, to live the life that you have called us to live, and that more abundantly. Oh, Father, would you help us? Would you forgive me of my sins? Lord, as I repent them to you. And for, and maybe there are others today that have confessed sins, and confessed brokenness, confessed uh, just complacency in their life today. And I pray that that would uh, be a healing moment, that you would heal our hearts, that you would cleanse them as hyssop as you did your servant David. That we might follow you with renewed hope, with renewed strength in your grace. Pray these things that you would be glorified above all. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing this. We are standing on hope. 